Welcome to the world of MCA DiscoVision. To begin playback of a disc, turn the player power on, place the disc on the spindle. Use the play button to start. vision that you be the boss. Now I'd like to show you some of the valuable things your MCA Discovision system lets you do. Most persons find it more convenient. Gently pull up as you press down on the center shaft with your thumb. You hear a click. Simply plug one jack into this outlet. After I stop the action, you're going to practice using these buttons. The DiscoVision player gives you many special capabilities. Stop, play, slow, forward and reverse. Imagine a dog chasing a rabbit around a tree. How can you get there in a hurry? Now you enter the number just like dialing a push button telephone. Two, six, Three, two, four, search. By the way, notice that the sound cuts off when you're running at anything other than normal speed.
How's it going, Internet? Did you enjoy the new uh, Q music? <laughs> I hope you did. <laughs> uh, having some fun today. It's a Monday, so some happiness would be appreciated. How'd you, how'd you like getting Rickrolled? <laughs> um, all right, so... This is uh, our our Monday live stream. Uh, Ask Tim, you can put us quick. It says it's reconnecting. I think we're good. I think we're good. All right. So I saw the spinner. Anyways, um, yeah. So there we go. We're back. Our uh, our Monday morning live stream here. Uh, you can ask questions in the chat about three D printers in general. It doesn't have to be about our products. If you have a question, I'll do my best to answer it. Um, so let's uh, let's get to it. So put your questions in the chat, and we'll go up to an hour. We uh, we are trying to stay around an hour. So let's see here. Let me make chat larger so I can actually see it, and we'll. Uh, Close Streamlabs settings down. All right, so who we got in the house today? We got R. Mills, Andrew Massey, Nemo Griff, Derek Cirillo, Miko87, Mark Clayton, Jonathan Barnes. See a lot of regulars here. Um, Tom, that's what you get for recrolling us. No, that's just YouTube. Just another day in using YouTube. Um, but let's see here. All right. Morning. Oh, AU. <laughs> Let's see here. All right, Mark. Mark is going to kick off our question today, and he says, Hey, Tim, just purchased a new Creality 427 board from my stock under 3. Swapped it out super easy. Now when attempting to print a test cube, the thermal runaway kicks in and shuts down. Um, now, did you check to make sure that your hot end and bed are heating up? Like, if you just tell it to heat, um, is it getting up to temperature normally? And is it staying at that temperature? Um since you just swapped the board, I would recommend checking all of your screw terminals and make sure that they're actually tightened down all the way. Um, and tell the bed and hot end to heat individually and see if the hot end rises when you tell it to heat um, and vice versa for the for the bed too. Uh, because what sometimes you can do is if you accidentally swapped the bed and the hot end, if you tell the hot end to heat and the bed heats up, you obviously know you have the bed hooked up to the hot end terminal. Um but yeah, so I would uh, I would recommend checking that. Um, it's it could be a connection issue, or you could actually have an issue with the printer. Um, you know, that's that's one thing. People are like, well, I updated the firmware and I got thermal runaway. Well, it's properly set up, and actually on our firmware, we have the value set pretty conservatively to prevent false triggering. So if you are using our firmware, and I highly recommend you do. Um, I would double check that you don't actually have a problem with the printer because it could even be an intermittent intermittent connection with the heater it could be an intermittent connection with the thermistor but that feature is there to prevent the printer from starting a fire which can happen fairly easily if uh you know if if it's if it's not fixed in a timely manner um that's the printer trying to tell you there's something wrong now there could be an issue with the board maybe the board has a problem um but it really depends on what you had. You said you have an original Ender 3, so you might not have had thermal runaway on there unless you updated the firmware. I'm just going on information I have here. Um, so I would uh, I would, I would recommend checking your connections. I'd be checking the connections um, to do the individual heat test first. So tell the hot end to heat, not the bed, just the hot end, and see if the hot end actually starts rising in temperature. Um, if it does, then you know you have the connections right. But if you tell the hot end to heat and the bed starts... Um, if the bed starts warming up, then obviously, you know, you hook the bed up to the hot end terminal and I'm assuming then the hot end would be on the bed. So that's, uh, that's what I would recommend. Um, yeah, he said it's all stocks. I'm assuming then you probably didn't even update the firmware, uh, which means if it's an original one, you, you probably don't have thermal runaway on a lot of the original Creality under threes did not have thermal runaway on them. They only started doing that. Uh, recently on some, some of the 115 boards, um, some didn't, um, but with the 115 boards and then as far as I know, all the 42X boards, so 422, 427, those firmware should have thermal runaway on. Um, that's what I would recommend. Um, let's see here. I know there were other questions here. Um, 
Dex, what are your tips for cable management? Any good brand of cable looming? Should I use shrink tubes at the end? Um, cable management is really up to your personal preference. Like, I like the spiral wrap stuff. Like, if I'm wrapping my own cable assembly that I made, um, I do like those spiral wraps. Um, they don't, I, they don't, I don't think they look as pretty as like the mesh, but the spiral wraps are a lot easier to work with, um, because you can split wires out of them easily. And, uh, if you have heat shrink, uh, heat shrinking ends, whether you're using the spiral wrap or the, um, like the, uh, nylon mesh style stuff is not a bad idea. Cause it's going to keep that in place. Um, usually when I do the spiral wraps, I'll put a zip tie at the end. I won't heat shrink it, but I'll put a zip tie at the end. Um, you can do that as well with the mesh, but if you have heat shrink, you're looking for a cleaner look. Um, that's always a good option. Um, but zip ties are a little bit quicker to remove to and replace. Um, whereas heat shrink, if you have to do maintenance, you have to slip it back on and that can be kind of a pain. Whereas a zip tie, you can just kind of throw on the end, um, and snip it off if you need to get to the wires and put a new one on when you're done. Um, that's just, just my recommendation. Um, Oh yeah, R Mills makes a good point. Yeah, check your thermistor too, because if you flip the thermistors, um, let's say your bed thermistor is in the hot end port and your hot end thermistor is in the bed port, you'll get wildly different readings because it's reading the hot end temperature instead of the bed and the bed instead of the hot end. So I would just double check that. It's, it could be a cabling issue or it could actually have a problem. So um, it sounds like you did have the stock board in there, which means you don't have thermal runaway protection. If that's a really old one, it sounds like it is. Um, so you could have had an issue where it's intermittent connection or you have a problem on the hot end and you just never knew because you didn't have that feature on the board. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Moving down. I see we got George Moody dubbed out, jumped in, uh, V rich. Mario Diaz says he just got his easy board run. It's so quiet. I have to, have to take a second look behind my shoulder to make sure the printer is working. I know that feeling. I, I, I unpopular opinion here. I kind of like the noise that stepper drivers make. Um, that's, that's just my opinion. I don't mind the noise. I, I, I find it like, I don't like, I don't mind background noise. Now I did, you know, my, my background before we started TH3 was in IT. So I was always used to working near server racks and that kind of stuff. So I didn't mind white noise. Um, and I'm the kind of person that likes to sleep with a fan on just for the noise for the most part. So, uh, Paul, the Texan, which 3d printer makes me a better person than everyone else, the Voron or the hypercube? Well, I, I wouldn't say better person than everybody else, but certainly something. Um, <laughs> I, I know exactly what you mean, though, because if you guys have ever been in either of those community, people can be pretty pretentious. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons why I haven't built either of those machines. Um, there's a certain type of person that builds a Voron. <laughs> I'm not saying they're bad printers. I'm just saying there's a certain type of person that builds those machines. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, do do do. Virish says, uh, are 100K thermistors good for higher temps? And he's saying 300 plus C. Um, I would say no. There are some that say they can go up to that temperature, but most 100K thermistors, they're going to max out around 300. So the, the highest I would recommend using those for is around 290 because you want to give yourself some cushion. Um, that's why we advertise like our tough hot ends. Uh, that we sell like the dual and the single, we only advertise them up to 290 because we want some headroom on that thermistor. So there are other options for higher temp, like there's a PT 1000, uh, option that you can use. Um, that's a, I think it's classified as a thermistor because it doesn't have to have an amplifier board because there's also the PT 100, which E3D commonly is the one that sells those and those require an amplifier board. Uh, but both of those are typically rated up to 350 if I, if memory serves correctly. Um, you know, but most people, I mean, unless you're doing some crazy materials, um, a hundred K thermistor is going to work for like 99% of people out there, you know, and there are that 1% of people that are printing really high temp materials. And usually you then want to go to something like, you know, like the, the, uh, slice engineering stuff, like the mosquitoes, that kind of stuff is, is geared towards high temp printing. Um, you can do it on like V6s and whatnot. Um, it really depends on your application and what you're looking to spend. 
Uh, but I personally would not use a standard 100K thermistor past 290. Um, that's that's where I would say the cutoff would be. Uh, but there are some out there that claim up to 350C. I have not tested them that far, um, but I have seen them. I have seen listings for them. So, because you don't want to damage the thermistor. Uh, let's see. Mark Mayas says, I have an MKS Gen L. I have a touchscreen for the I have a touchscreen for the SD slot but it will only print from the USB um I'm a, okay he says USB cable I mean I use LCD as well as touchscreens crap it's a MKS TFT32 um I believe some of those screens I don't know if that's the one you have I'll look it up you said MKS TFT32 those usually have um, if this is the one I'm thinking of, I'm going to look it up here. MKS TFT32. Yeah, so those mich those those LCDs have an SD slot and a USB port on them for like a flash drive. Um, all those do is stream G code over a serial connection. Um, that's what that's what it's doing. So it's actually streaming G code over the serial connection from the LCD to the board. So that screen is actually handing the sending handling the sending of the g code um if it's not printing off the slot on the sd card then it sounds like it's an issue with the sd or on the sd slot on the actual lcd um i would recommend just changing out that touchscreen if it's a gen l or uh, which you said it is uh the 12864 lcd screen is a really good pairing with that board and that has an onboard sd slot as well and you also get a lot more features than the mks tft32 because that's i believe looking at i pulled it up here um those are one of those that have their own standalone chip on them it's an stm32 chip and that more limited firmware that these are these are the type of lcds that originally uh started my dislike of the touch screens because like i said they they communicate over g-code um, their firmware is completely separate from the actual firmware on your printer's board. So that, uh, it is not a very good combination. Uh, George says, thanks for fixing the KP3 firmware. You're welcome. I verified that on here. So I'm glad to know that you also confirmed that. Uh, it's always nice to have a double confirmation. Like we do try to test the firmware on actual machines here. Uh, but as we get more and more machines supported, we might not always have those machines in house, but I do have the KP3 still here in house. Um, Matt Peter says planning, are you, he's planning to update the firmware to the hero me gen five install. I know currently I don't have fast probing on, but I'm using easy ABL pro. Do you recommend that option? So there's, there's two settings for probing speeds in our firmware. There's a fast probe, which is what's on by default. And that's an eight millimeter second probing speed. Uh, most printers can run that. Now, if you have your printer, uh, well dialed in, everything's moving correctly. You can try the super fast probing speed, which is going to bring the probing speed up to 15 millimeters a second, which will significantly reduce the probing speed time. So um, what I recommend people do is uncomment, run it on your printer, make sure to reset the EEPROM between flashing and make sure, you know, do some probes, do some G29s, do some M48 probe tests and make sure that your, your Z gantry can actually keep up with that speed. Um, machines like the CR10 S4 and the S5, uh, might not always be able to run that fast of a speed. So that's what I recommend. And we have a note on that option to make sure your machine can actually physically run it. So if you notice stepping or if you notice like uh, steps being missed or you notice uh, like the Z is not moving correctly, then drop it back down to the regular fast probe speed. Uh, R Mills says uh, does pet g have similar high heat properties like a as abs like i could print pet g for a piece on the heated bed uh no uh the temperatures you want to look up for different material types is what's called the glass transition temperatures and that's the temperature at which the material starts to become soft and pliable um typically pla is about 60 degrees celsius is its glass transition temp uh, those are also the temperatures we usually use on our bed. So we keep them a little more soft so they stay on the bed and don't warp as much. Uh, PETG is around 80 C and ABS is 105. So PETG could be used on bed parts, but if you start getting up to those temperatures, you're going to start seeing the parts warp if they're in direct contact or you know close enough to the bed where they're going to pick up that heat. So I typically use anything around my bed 
gets printed in ABS just because I want those high temp resistances. Um, and even at ABS's, you know, 100 C temperature, I've never had any ABS parts where they've failed um, being printed on a bed that's printing ABS, so at 100 C. So, uh, but PETG does not have the same resistant properties as ABS, not, not even close. They're talking about a 20 to 25 degree C difference in its temp resistance. So PETG is not a bad material to use, but it's not as uh, temperature resistant as ABS will be. So... Um, I also think ABS is a little more impact resistant too. So depending on your application, that could be a factor. Uh, but the downside is ABS, you have to have an enclosure to print. So PETG, you do not. So that's the trade-off. That's why most people do PETG over ABS is because you don't need an enclosure to print PETG, whereas ABS, you do. Um, let's see. Dominic says, I have Ender 5 Pro with an easy board, easy rail, octo printer. Is there something I might have done that caused me to lose my EEPROM settings? Um, you could have a plugin on Octoprint that's overriding them. Um, you could have just accidentally reset it. Or if you flash your firmware, if it's a different version number uh, that Marlin, the Marlin base is built on, you'll get a reset. We actually have that on in the firmware now where it'll force a reset if it detects a different version number for the EEPROM settings that are on the board. So that way it forces people to reset the EEPROM because if you have EEPROM settings from an old version of the firmware and you flash to a new one, it can cause a lot of weird results. So, um, Andrew Massey got his firmware updated with the bootloader kit. That's good. A few communication errors, a com port on both printers, but now you're good to go. Yeah, sometimes it takes, like, if you got to sort drivers out with some of the boards, but we have, we actually have those on our site. So, that would be, that's a good resource. Um, let's see here. Moving down, moving down. Uh, we got DeWitt, the other Tim. Um, any re recommendation on the good iDeck printer? Doesn't need to be enclosed for a long production run type of parts around 900 pieces. And so needs to be reliable. Landed a job today. Um, I've mentioned this before. Um, there's a guy named Michael over in the UK that I converse with and he's a friend of mine i've known him for a couple of years here in the 3d printing spaces um he runs a company called j supplied and they're a craftbot reseller and he i haven't used the craftbot machines but he loves them for production stuff they have a lot of craftbot idex machines and they use them for actual production prints so um i've heard good things about those from him and a few other people um, I know Joe, Te Joe Telling had some issues with his, but again, I haven't personally tested it, uh, but I, I've had many a picture sent to me from Michael of different multi-material prints that he's ran on those machines, and they're they're not the best quality printer in terms of print quality, but they're meant to, meant to be more of a reliable commercial type machine. Um, and you know, sometimes what you'll get with these more commercial machines is they might not be absolutely perfect print quality, but they're meant to be reliable to get the jobs done. So, um, yeah, cause I remember seeing some of those prints. I'm like, I mean, that's good, but you know, I see a little bit of like, you know, it's not perfectly tuned. Um, he's like, you know, yeah, but we're, we're making functional parts. So, um, anyways, let's see here. We're only 19 minutes in. You guys are already out of questions. What the heck chat? Come on. It's, it's two nineteen. And I'm already out of questions to answer. It's your guys' job to ask questions for me to try to answer. Um, I'm trying to think if I have any updates on stuff. Um, I don't think so. I, I did get my Ender 5 Plus hooked back up, which is behind me. I also moved, I don't know if you guys see, I moved my rep box and my palette 2 and I put the 2S kit on there. So I'm going to be playing more with the multi-material stuff on there with my Ender 5 Plus. So that'll be fun. Um, I do have a Sunlu S8 stream. I'm going to be scheduling that for tomorrow. I have all the hot end parts mounted. Um, I have all the, all the uh, hot end parts printed. I'm going to show how to mount them and everything. I got the upgraded 5015 fan. I'm also going to be putting a... Um, I'm also going to be putting a, uh, aluminum extruder on it that we carry a flex plate 
and the uh, AZABL system on there. So they'll be doing a live build, upgrading that. And hopefully that should make that printer pretty solid then because my main complaint was the layer fan not being adequate. So we're going to go ahead and replace that with a new mount. Um, let's see here. Matt Peter says he'd be trying to fast probe on Ender 3 with the TH3 Dual Z kit installed in the Easy Board. Yeah, you should be good. I run super fast probing on my Ender 3s with it, and it, it chooches just fine. Um, Travis says, what processor can I use to upgrade my SKR E3 DIP board? You throw it out, and you buy a board with more memory. There's our board, there's a Creality board. Um, unless you have unless you have surface mount repair tools and you have the bootloader for it you're not going to be able to easily replace that CPU and I probably wouldn't spend the time on it um, when I removed their so I had a e3 I think it was a version 1.2 or a 1 point or 2.0 um, their PCB is so like low quality or copper count or whatever. Um, that when I was removing stuff from it, like I usually do with our easy boards, the pads lifted, um, using the same heat set. I was using about 300 C for the hot air, um, a little on the higher end, but, uh, same settings I use on other machines and I haven't had issues with, uh, with anything lifting, but their, their pads lifted. So I probably wouldn't even, I probably wouldn't even bother messing with it to be completely honest. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, Jeff is asking about the Easy Plug. They're in manufacturing right now. Um, I'm hoping. I, I'm. I'm gonna be honest. I the estimated date I got for the completion of the first batch um, was putting it towards the end of the year. But with everything going on right now, I'm gonna say they'll probably be out early January. We've sent. Uh, I had over 20 of them, and I've only got 12 left here. So we've sent out a bunch of different people for testing already. Um, like a lot of the people who got them, um, there's no documentation yet, but they were able to figure it out in about five minutes. So that's, that's good, but we will have documentation. I just want people to get the hardware and play with it and that kind of stuff. Um, Mario says, any recommendations to turn a CR 10 S into 24 volt? Um, if you're converting any machine, you got to replace the components that require, uh, or that are, you know, basically limited to the original design voltage. So like the heated bed, the heaters, the fans. So you would have to be, you would have to replace the heated bed heater, um, whether it's putting a silicone one on or completely replacing the bed with a 24 volt one, um, all your fans and all your, and your heater cartridge and your hot end. So that's the kind of stuff that's usually voltage specific. Um, most of the Crowley boards will run on 12 to 24 volts unless you have a really old CR 10. Um, and the way you can check is look at the voltage rating on the caps and see if the voltage rating is 16 or if it's like 35 is usually what they ship out on the boards that are dual voltage. Um, that's, that's what I would do. It's, I haven't converted mine. Um, I've been happy enough with the stock bed on my CR 10. It works pretty well. Changing out the cabling, going to the bed and adding a MOSFET on makes it heat up fairly quick. Um, I feel like the stock wiring kind of clamps down on how many amps can get to it because it's just a thinner wire. So I run 12 gauge to mine. I get to 60 C in about five minutes. So perfectly acceptable for a 12 volt bed. Uh, let's see here. Is there a way to enable E step adjustment on the unified for, for the ender silent one, one five board? Yeah, it's in the firmware settings. You can actually change that. Um, that board, I can't remember if we were able to get it back from the LCD or not. Um, I thought we did because we were able to do some sp more space saving than we did on Marlin 119. Um, but that would be on the new Unified 2 firmware, not the 1. So check the Unified 2 firmware. Um, either way in the Unified 1 and 2, which that board is supported in both, mich both firmware branches, but you should be using 2 now. Um, I would go ahead and set it in there. Um, and use Unified 2, and like I said, I believe E-Step adjustment is back on the LCD on Unified 2, but it's not on 1 because there wasn't enough space. But with Unified 2, with Marlin 2, and VS Code, and all the optimizations that came along with those new platforms and code bases, we are able to get more features onto the board with that same limited processor. 
Um, Jesse Spark says, I'd really like to get Unified installed on my CR10 v2, but I get an error when I try to send a firmware. Um, is there anything I missed stepwise? Um, the main thing with that printer that already has a bootloader with that board, it's 2560 chip. So if you're using the Unified 2, which you should be, that printer is supporting Unified 2, um, you might have to specify your COM port, and you might also have to update the drivers for the printer on your on your computer itself. Um, the This is assuming that the board has the bootloader, and those boards are supposed to come with the bootloaders. I haven't seen one that hasn't. Um, or it's also possible that the bootloader could be corrupt, and it might need to be reflashed. So... But with the CR10 V2, the 2560 boards are usually you plug them in and you just upload the firmware to them. Um, like I said, you could also might you also might need to update the drivers for the board. Which if you look on our website, we have drivers for the FT232R chip and the CH340. It's going to use one of those two drivers. I believe that board uses the FT232R chip, and that's the USB to serial chip on the board. So if you look for like a rectangular chip near the USB port. Um, that's fairly large. I want to say they're about 15 millimeters long by about seven or eight millimeters wide with a bunch of legs on either side. Um, you look on the top and look for either FT 232 or CH 340. Um, and that'll tell you what driver to use because Creality has used both of those chips on their various boards. So like the one, one X style boards have come with the CH340 and the FT232R. So, but those are both USB to serial converters, and that's the driver you need to update. So, make sure all your slicers are closed because if you have any slicers tying up that COM port. VS Code's not going to be able to update the COM port. And if you have multiple COM ports, you might need to manually specify your COM port, which we just published an article in the Help Center today on manually specifying your COM port in VS Code. So, make sure to check that out. Uh, let's see here. Dominic, if I change my bed service, do I need to reset your Z offset? That's a it depends thing. Um, it really depends on what surface you're changing from and to. If they're both similar types, like metal to metal, then usually you're good. But I'd recommend when you start a print with a new one, um, with a new surface or a different surface, press the button two steps uh, so you get the baby stepping on the screen. And then adjust that on your first layer. I usually do the the skirt or the perimeter around the part and I'll do my adjustment on there. So it's always a good idea to keep an eye on it. And if you're running, I think you said you're running a, uh, a an ABL system, then you'll have the option to adjust that if you're using our firmware. So, uh, do, do, do. Dave is asking, what do I think about the exo slide kits? I built an exo queue with very disappointing print quality. Um, I've seen them. I haven't used them. I know some people that really like them out. I also know some people that really don't like them. Um, I personally don't see the point of going to those over V slots. Um, I see the point of going to linear rails, but I feel like the exo slides are kind of gimmicky, and this is just my personal opinion. Um, I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying they're good. I'm just saying they seem kind of gimmicky and are more of a, uh, what was the term, a lateral move, you know, not vertical, but um, it, it's just kind of a little, maybe a little bit better, a little more constrained than the uh, V slots. But if I'm correct, they're using a lot of plastic parts for those carriages. So um, I don't know, V slot, when it's properly adjusted, runs really well. That's why we see a lot of these machines using V slot. It's, it's cost effective and it works, but just got to make sure everything's all adjusted correctly with the eccentric nuts and all your bolts are tight. Um, do, do, do. Jeff is asking, I just put an easy board in a flash unify firmware. How does the Z offset wizard work? So that's a new Marlin feature that we put into our firmware too. Um, how it works is it will home the printer and then it will display a message on screen and give you options to move it down. And that'll give you your initial Z offset. Um, so you run it through the wizard, you, you press it on the screen, it'll say homing X, Y, Z, and then it'll home. And then it'll put the nozzle at five millimeters off the bed, um, as to what it thinks is that distance. So then you can move it, uh, I believe it's 0.1 or 1.1 and 0 0.025 millimeters increments and adjust it down with the knob. And then you can hit the done button and then it stores the offset. Now that's just to get your initial one. I still would highly recommend when you start your first print after setting it is be ready to baby step it. So check because that'll get you close, but it's not always going to get you bang on. 
Um, you can use it if you want. We put it in there because I thought it was a neat feature. Um, so I would recommend giving that a try and see how it is. Otherwise, just follow our normal installation um, for setting the Z offset like you would on any other machine. Uh, let's see here. Gerardo's asking about B-Stock plates. Uh, for those, email streams at th3dstudio.com. Aaron is monitoring that mailbox, and if we have any, he will let you know. I don't know what B-Stock flex plates we have at this point. I know we sent out quite a bit of them um, over the last week or two, but you can email, and if we have some, he'll let you know. Um, let's see. Someone else about the Z-Offset Wizard. I just did that. Um, do 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 George Moody uh, is saying, did my easy plug get shipped out? Well, if you emailed us, then yes, I put the order. And you should have got an email confirmation. But if you want to just follow up, uh, email streams at th3dstudio.com. And I can double check that when we're done with the stream here. But everybody that sent me a message and has had their plugs that we gave away sent out. So if you didn't send the email to that specific mailbox, don't send it anywhere else. Send it to streams at th3dstudio.com, George, and I can follow up on that after the stream. Uh, let's see here. Nemo says, I installed EasyO Pro, went through the baby step wizard. I did a live adjustment until I saw that I got enough switch, but there are some areas that are too close to the bed, skirt stick. Um, I would check your gantry. Uh, I don't know what machine you're using it on, but... If your gantry is not level with the printer's frame, not your bed, so meaning it's the equal distance on the left and right side. So you got your printer frame, and then you have the gantry. The distance between this side and the frame and this side and the frame have to be the same because it's a bed leveling system. It's not a gantry leveling system. So you have to make sure that your gantry is within one to two millimeters difference. Uh, the lower, the better. Um, so you might need to physically adjust your gantry. If you have an Ender 3, um, there is a channel called the Edge of Tech, and he has a X Gantry rework video, and he has a whole series on building that printer very well. Uh, that's based off of Luke Hack Hatfield's uh, help guide. Um, highly recommend checking that out. But usually, there's actually an article in our help center if you just search Easy ABL slanting, because um, usually people say, well, my, it's a slanted result. I mean, you're closer on one side and higher on the other. That usually indicates a physical issue with your printer that mechanically needs to be addressed because the software is assuming the bed is what needs correcting. Um, it doesn't have the capability to compensate for other mechanical issues on your printer. It's just levels your bed. That's that's it. Or trams it, whatever you want to call. Um, let's see here. Uh, Travis, we don't sell any heated beds. Uh, Ken Corcoran, why in the unified form do you say not to turn on heaters while probing unless directed to do so? Uh, that's a deprecated feature that's not in the newer ones. Um, because with ABL sensors, ours and BL touches and other stuff, you want to try to mitigate as much electrical interference as you can. And one of the things that does that is we actually have the firmware turn the heaters off as the probe is coming down um, to take a reading. So it reduces the pulsing of those heaters. Um, it also can help stabilize the power supply voltage too because those heaters aren't pulsing on and off causing the voltage to go like this a little bit. Um, that feature won't be in the later releases. It's not in Unified 2. That's only a thing in Unified 1. Uh, just don't use it. Um, it's not needed. It ends up especially with the BL touches that don't have the, sh the shielded cable or the power filtering, um, you can get more of a variance in your sensor reading. Uh, let's see here. Eggbird's asking about magnetic flex plates for SLA printers. We've shelved that idea. Um, if you guys are looking for magnetic plates for resin printers, go check out tinymachines3d.com. They have their TM uh, resin flex system. Um, it's just not a market I want to get into at this point. So, R mills, what's the games command? That's define, I believe it's define games underscore mode. Um, if you look at the configuration underscore ADV file, you'll see a mention of games mode somewhere in there. Uh, let's see here. But that's only for machines that actually have extra space, like the Easy Board and uh, Creality's 422, 427 boards. Don't try to enable that on the 8-bit boards. The Big Tree Tech ones might be able to get away with it, but they're 
they're pushing close to their 256k limit anyways. Um, let's see here. Hugo says, uh, quick question. So I did a long print on the Ender 5 Pro. I had a layer shift in the same shift in the same exact spot. Did a different print, it doesn't layer shift. Any ideas where to look? Um, depending on depending on so it sounds like it's not a mechanical issue, but what could be happening is you could have something on the print in that location curling up and physically hitting the nozzle. I had a couple prints where it would do that, and I'm like, this printer's not losing steps. And then I sat there and watched it once it got close to that point on the print and I watched the nozzle hit it and it was enough to cause it to lose a couple steps. So I would, I would check that. It's usually something stupid. Um, that's where I would start. Um, it could just be that it's physically hitting something. And it's enough of a, you know, jerk for it to skip that step on the motors or motor, depending on which one, which one or ones are losing steps. Um, Timothy's end. Can the BTT 14 turbo use a PT 100? I would assume it could, but I haven't hooked up that sensor with the, that board. Um, I would reach out to them and see if they have recommended pins. Like with our easy board, we have documentation on where to hook that up and even an option, the firmware, but I haven't hooked that one up to their board. Um, and I want to want to tell you, Oh, just use any IO pin because they do have pins that have filtering on them, which might interfere with the PT 100 board. So, but if it's a PT 100, you need to have the, the PT 100 and that goes into an amplifier board. And then the amplifier board connects to your printer's control board. You'll have a, a power, a ground, and then an actual signal pin. So, uh, Dr. Jack says, hasn't been paying attention to the easy plugs, but do they work with Google home? No. Uh, they can indirectly work with Google Home, and I, I this might lead into a. Uh, I'm kicking around the ideas of another product to try to get people into, um, not only managing their like Octoprint instances, but also kind of a foray into home automation. Um, you can use our Easy Plugs, but you have to have something else to talk to them, and that something is called Home Assistant. So the Easy Plugs are completely locally controlled there's no um there's no cloud there's there's none of that stuff it's all on only on your network i don't have a way to send commands to it i don't have a way to send firmware updates to it um it's the goal of the plug was to be able to use it with octoprint and octoprint has a plugin so if your octoprint instance is available online um through like a plugin or something you can then control the outlet through octoprint these do have a web interface, but again, this is all local controlled. The goal of these is to have a plug on your network that has no cloud connectivity, so you don't have to worry about this kind of security risks that are on it with open source firmware that you can actually look at the code and verify what's going into it. Um, you know, like a lot of these other plugs, they're all from Chinese companies and they all phone home back to the servers in China, um, which I'm not comfortable with. So, but with Home Assistant, Home Assistant's an open source project. I've talked about this before on the channel. Um, and they actually just came out with an official Home Assistant device that's based on the Odroid boards. Um, but it's basically a box, comes with Home Assistant pre-installed on it. You plug it into your network and basically Home Assistant can be a central point for all your like local devices like this or Octoprint door sensors, whatever. It's a very powerful platform, but you can connect Home Assistant to Google Home. Um, it's like five bucks a month for their Nab Nabu Casa is what they call it, but it's a easy, quick setup integration to connect home assistant to Google home. So you would go from Google to home assistant. Um, and they also support the Amazon echo devices. So you can go from, you know, your smart assistant to home assistant, and then home assistant can send the command to your local device. So, and that's how I have everything set up here. So all of my smart home stuff, everything, lights, switches, sensors, it all talks to Home Assistant, and then Home Assistant talks to Google Home. So, and the nice thing about that is even if my internet's down, I can hit the, open up my browser and bring up Home Assistant's page from my phone, my desktop, my tablet, my laptop, whatever, and control my devices, even if I have no internet access. So, um, but I, I do feel like I'm going to probably do something, whether it's documentation or we have a pre-set up Home Assistant box, um, I've been, I was thinking about doing a home assistant box anyways, kind of like what we do with the Pi kits, but on something a little more powerful than a Raspberry Pi 4, because you can run home assistant on a Raspberry Pi, but, um, but 
it's not going to last once you really get into it. So the pies are great to get your feet wet with Home Assistant, but if you're doing automations and you start adding 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 devices, I've got 250 devices connected to my Home Assistant setup. Um, the pies start to bog down. They're limited by the SD card. So um, I ordered three of their little Home Assistant boxes that they announced yesterday, and they're limited. I guess they're not going to be a regular thing, um, but it supports the project, and I'm going to move mine off of my virtual machines onto these dedicated little development boards. They're basically like a pie on steroids. So, and that's something I was thinking about doing anyways. I don't know if we will, but I do think Home Assistant's awesome. Home Assistant works with Octoprint. It works with the Wi-Fi plugs. It works with tons of different integrations. So if you guys haven't checked it out, um, I'll post a link in here. Oh, I feel a sneeze coming on. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, it, nope. Mm. Okay, I think I'm good. It's home-assistant.io is a website, so check that out. Um, let me go back here and see what's going on. Um, do, 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 do. We were talking about the Easy Plug. Egram's Wizard works great. Just try an Easy Word install, but I agree, 100% agree on throwing a skirt down. Check the initial laydown. Yeah, I would, I would highly recommend that. C5RC has got his Easy Plug that he won. Um, Nemo says, I use the leveling box to check the gantry. Um, honestly, because this is a stream, um, unless you're going to post it in the discord, but we're, we're only got like 15 more minutes, roughly of time, um, contact our support guys and send them pictures of what you're seeing and they'll be able to guide you in the right direction of what to look for. If there's anything that needs to be adjusted, that kind of stuff. Um, do, do, do. Uh, do, do. Dog, can you remind everyone to check to make sure that things like nozzles might be folded up into the packaging of TH3D orders? Oh, did you accidentally throw some nozzles out or almost? Um, yeah, I mean, we use craft paper to pack all of our stuff, so unwrap it. Um, I know when I pack the orders and the other people should be doing it, so if they're not, we'll usually staple the little baggie with the nozzles to the packing slip. So it's got more area of stuff to have uh, to have it not get lost. So, but I will let the shipping team know because they're supposed to be doing that. If they're not, well, it will get addressed. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do do do. Where Arm Hill's putting the games back on your easy board tonight. Uh, some Thingiverse models have manifold issues. Yes, they do. Um, Jeff Cullen says, Easy Plug is the only way I'm going to leave my Enders going when I leave the house. I have a fire suppression set up. It's the last piece of the puzzle. Yeah, so the Easy Plug will be nice because y the plugin for Tasmoda with Octoprint, so Octoprint on a Pi with the Easy Plug together will allow, even if the printer's firmware completely screws up, and the printer's hard locked, the plugin will shut the AC power to the printer off. So let's say worst case scenario, there's a dead short or something and it's it's just smoking. It can actually cut the power going to the printer's power supply and kill it. So I I really like that. We're getting ready to roll them out on almost every machine in the farm once the shipment comes in of them. Um, because not only will it help us save power because machines aren't idling all the time, but also if there's an issue, it will cut the power off. So. A Grimm says, what's your preferred method for calibrating Z height? Um, I don't. The Z steps per millimeter, um, is determined by your motor angle of stepping, which is usually 1.8 degrees. Your stepper motor driver step mode, which is usually 1 16th, and your lead screw pitch. This is a fixed variable that does not change. So on most machines, that's 400 steps per millimeter with a 1 16th stepping driver mode and a 1.8 degree motor. Now let's say you go to a 0.9 degree motor, but you have the same driver stepping. That would now be 800, so you double it. Um, that kind of stuff. So you're not, anybody who's telling you to calibrate your X, Y, and Z steps per millimeter has no idea what they're talking about because X and Y are also determined by those same kind of factors. And instead of lead screw pitch, 
it's the diameter of the pulley that's on the motor. So those are static values. If you have anything else off like that, you would want to be doing the tuning in your actual printer's slicer, not the firmware itself. Uh, Kevin Bird, do the easy plug have power feedback, amps, volts, watts, etc.? So there's a standard one, which is the 1999 one, and there's a 2499 one. The only difference between those two is the 2499 one has power monitoring features. So watts, amps, volts, and uh, the VA, as well as power factor. So it has all those, and those data, that data can also be fed into a system like Home Assistant to actually log your usage on that machine. So we're going to have both. So there's one that people just want on off and there's also on off with all the power monitoring stuff. So that's another thing too. You could set like, let's say with home assistant too. Um, let's say you have home assistant set up. You could have a rule set up that let's say, you know, your printer doesn't under normal conditions, doesn't exceed, you know, three amps of power pulling out of the wall. You could set up an automation with home assistant, uh, while still allowing Octoprint to talk to the plug to cut the plug off. If it exceeds, if it's reporting a, amperage value past what you specify so i could set up a rule saying hey if this plug for this printer goes over 3.5 amps shut it off and send me a push notification to my phone um it's it's awesome um so i definitely do want to cover more home automation stuff here if you guys haven't checked out home assistant check it out um it's all open source and then you can also um also would recommend if you do want to integrate with Alexa or the Google Home, they have their, it's five bucks a month. It's helps support the development. It's an open source project. I do it. Um, and it's seamless integration. And they even give you a URL with no port forwarding that you can access your home assistant installation outside of the house. So if you had that, so for five bucks a month, you could have it controlling all of your stuff and have external access with no port forwarding to your home assistant installation. Um, you can do it for free you, with external access. You can do port forwarding, but they include a SSL certificate. They include direct integration with Google Home and, and the Amazon Echoes, all for that five bucks a month. You can do all of it manually, but I can tell you as someone who is intimately familiar with it and can do the free options, the amount of time it would take, I'm paying the five bucks a month because it's just an ease of use thing. It helps to support the development of the software. Um, to give you an example, the Google Home installation, um, if, if you're doing it yourself, requires port forwarding. It also requires that you set up a development app that also has to be refreshed every month because Google will kill it off. So every month, all my stuff would stop talking to the Google Homes. Uh, whereas if you just pay them the five bucks a month, they handle that for you. They handle the SSL cert. They handle the external access. It's it's worth it. I think it's very well priced. My only complaint is that I can't prepay for a year or five or ten in advance because I would easily do it. So, um, and like with our plugs, you don't ever have to worry about like what's happening with the some of the TP-Link plugs where they're pushing out firmware updates that kill local control. Meaning if you were using a TP-Link plug, especially if you're in the UK, it seems to be isolated to the UK plugs right now, but I have had some reports of the US ones where they push a firmware update that breaks the local control. Meaning if you were using a TP-Link plug with Octoprint and you got this firmware update, it no longer works with Octoprint because they killed the local API. I have no control over these once I send them out to you guys. I have no way to push firmware updates. Um, we will probably at some point post a firmware update, but you can just download the file and update it over the web interface that these have. So you don't ever have to worry about the manufacturer taking away functionality from the product that you own. And I have some of the TP-Link devices, and I've n I'm not buying any more of them because I don't trust that they'll, uh, even if they step back on this, I don't trust that they'll stick to that. I don't want to be worried that the manufacturer is going to, decide to change their mind about what the customers should have access to on their own hardware and then roll an update that breaks everything. I can guarantee we will never do that for these because I've intentionally made it so we can't. Um, I could set up an OTA URL to download firmware updates automatically, but I don't, I don't want that. I'd rather people update them when they want them. And the reality is a simple device like this, it's probably not going to need firmware updates. It's not directly on the internet. It's on your local device. I've already tested and qualified. Everything works. So um, yeah. So anyways, um, we are getting up on, we're coming close to the one hour mark here. 
and uh, I I drank all of this before we started, so I have to use the restroom. <laughs> so, um, I appreciate everybody stopped by. Um, I want all you guys watching, all of you, go and read about Home Assistant. Go to Home Assistant, look it up. I think you'll all really like it. If you're sitting here watching me and you guys are into 3D printing and you're into tinkering, I think you'd really enjoy Home Assistant. And like I said, I do want to do more videos on it because especially now that we have more home automation type products, um, I've been thinking about getting more into that market because the overlap between home, home automation stuff and 3D printing is, is really big. So, and if you have a 3D printer, once you start getting to building your own devices, like I build my own home automation devices built around those little ESP boards, um, having a printer to print housings for them is awesome. So anyways, I want everybody to have a great day. Hope you guys are having a wonderful holiday coming up. Um, we're not doing too much of anything, so it's mostly that I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> but at least I have an excuse this year to be antisocial during the holidays. Um, but anyways, I appreciate everybody stopped by. Um, I'm asking every single one of you watching, go to the Home Assistant site, spend like 10 minutes reading up on it, and if you got a pie laying around, download it. They have a fully set up image. You flash it to the SD card and play with it. That's what I want you guys to do. Um, I like showing you guys new things, and I think you guys would really like it. And thanks for stopping by. Hope you guys have an awesome Monday. And as always, happy printing.